All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are so excited today to partner with our speaker. I'm gonna introduce them in just a second, but we're really happy to have them back for a whole new presentation. Right now, we are joined by six classes from across North America. So I'm gonna give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out before we get underway. Uh, sort of half joining us and still getting their tech working, we've got Miss Oster's grade fours in Spruce Grove, Alberta. So welcome to them. We've got Miss Pearson's grade fives in Calgary in Alberta. Hi guys. Hey, welcome in. All right, we've got, oh, it's George, wait, everyone's here, everyone arrived, perfect. We've got Miss Fisher's grade threes in Carsonville in Michigan. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, the two of them. <laughs> we love the enthusiasm coming in. All right, we've got Miss Holtz's grade fives in Innisfail in Alberta. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey, welcome. So many Alberta classes, I love it. We've got Miss Gary's grade twos in Woodbury in Minnesota. Hi, guys. In. We've got Mrs. Adrazi's grade threes in Bristol in Connecticut. Hi, guys. Uh, Welcome in. And last but not least, just joining us a second ago, we've got Miss George's grade ones in West Palm Beach in Florida, where we all wish we were. Hi, guys. Welcome in, Miss George's class. <laughs> we're going to get your mic working in a second, but you're there and you're enthusiastic. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all joining us today is for our speakers. So we are joined live in beautiful Banff National Park one of the most iconic and storied and original national parks in the world. Uh, and they're joining us for their fourth presentation ever. So we've covered bison, we've covered fish relocation, we've covered fire. Today, we are gonna talk about animal corridors. When you put roads through a park, you break apart the habitat. How do creatures get from one side to the other? Well, the amazing people at Banff National Park do some really fantastic work in ensuring that creatures are able to you know, connect with each other and pass through habitats and cross barriers like roads through these animal corridors. I don't want to spoil any more. I'm going to turn it over to Lori Schwartz joining us there, one of their fantastic education team. And so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Lori, and take it away. All right. So hi, thank you everybody so much for joining me. I'm super stoked to be here for my first presentation with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I'm especially proud to be part of the Women in STEM Month. Like, wow, how cool is that, right? But I have an amendment. I want to call it Women in STEAM because it's science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Because without the arts, we can't communicate all of the wonderful work that happens in all the rest of those uh, endeavors. So today, we are going behind the scenes in Banff National Park to find out how we build lifelines for wild animals and help them to survive here. And I hope that you all have your spy skills sharp because we're going to need those in a second. So I'm just gonna switch to my little presentation here. There we go. Can you see me there? Hi, everybody. All right, so first, a little bit of context. So what is Parks Canada all about? Well, it's the job of our Parks Canada team to look after all of our natural and cultural heritage. So if you've ever visited a national park or a national historic site or a marine conservation area in Canada, that's the, the stuff that we do. So we protect animals, plants, landscapes, and historic sites now and for the future. And I have the privilege to share the stories of these very special places with you. So let's get a bit of perspective for a moment, okay? Here's a view of the earth from space and Canada is right in the middle of the image. Do you see the borders? What if I zoom in a little bit? Do you see the borders yet? How about now if we go a little bit closer? Well, no, of course you can't see them because borders don't exist as a part of nature. Borders are drawn on maps by people to define territories that are ruled by different governments. So to wildlife, these lines that we draw are invisible. There are other kinds of lines that we build though that wildlife do have a hard time crossing. I'm gonna to get to that in a second, but let's go back to our lines that we draw. Here's the lines that define Canada. Now, if you know where the province of Alberta is in Canada, point at it from where you're sitting. Now, if you were pointing at the bit that turned green, you were correct. That is the province of Alberta. 
And that's where I'm at. And if we zoom in a little bit more, the green dot represents the city of Calgary. Now, Banff National Park is about an hour and a half drive from Calgary's International Airport. Around 4 million people visit us every year. So with that much visitation, we can face big challenges in balancing human use of the park with nature conservation. And there's a long cultural history here as well. We acknowledge that Banff National Park is within the present day territories of treaties six, seven, and eight, as well as the Métis homeland. The lands and waters of Banff have been used for millennia by indigenous people for sustenance, ceremony, trade, and travel. And we thank them for their continuous stewardship and for sharing the land with us. Now we can see part of the reason that this area is so important from the satellite view. Both historically and now, Banff connects all directions of travel from through the Rocky Mountains, north to south and east to west. So people had to find a way between the prairies and the west coast through the mountains. And originally, we would have been following the trails made by wild animals. As we zoom in on this view from space, we can see the white mountaintops. You guys see that? These are mostly rock and ice. So they're difficult places for humans and wildlife to live and to travel. But animals know the easiest way through the mountains. They would follow the river, they would follow the valleys, right? So if you see the valleys here, that's the dark green parts of the map. Now people follow these trails that were made by animals. They followed them generation after generation. And eventually they became established travel and trade routes. Now the Bow Valley in Banff National Park was a particularly good route because the mountain passes were a little bit easier and a bit more direct. So people could navigate east to west, north to south at this crossroads. One more zoom in and X marks the spot. Here I am, the town of Banff, right here. That's where I am the right this second actually. Now, if we look around this valley from this photo, it all looks pretty green, doesn't it? It looks like there's plenty of space in this valley. Would you say so? Probably, yeah. But let's test that idea a little bit closer. Here is the Bow River in blue. And here comes the town site. And here's the golf course and our recreation center. The highway is here in red. And the black bits are the really steep parts that are hard for animals to climb. Oh, and wait a second, there's one more. The top bit, rock and ice at the tops of our mountains. So not very much spare room now, is there? Since Banff became a national park in 1885, we've almost filled the Bow Valley with stuff from side to side, with roads, buildings, and these are the lines that I was talking about, the ones that animals find hard to cross. So we have a couple more lines here. We've got the Canadian Pacific Railway that runs about 24 trains a day through the middle of our national park. And we have the Trans-Canada Highway. That is a lifeline for people because it's one of only three ways to cross the Canadian Rockies by road. So there's a lot of traffic on that road. On average, one car every three seconds. So imagine if you were a bear trying to cross that road and there's a car whizzing by every three seconds. It makes it pretty difficult for you to get across, right? And guess what? People are really keen to see bears here. If somebody spots you at the side of the road, screech, you're gonna see this. And then probably this. This is what we call a bear jam. And it's not safe for people and it is not safe for the wildlife. So back in the 1980s, we were noticing a big increase in visitation to Banff National Park. And we were going to twin the highway. We had just a single road through. We wanted to increase the ability, uh, the, the capacity of the Trans-Canada Highway for traffic. So we thought, well, since we're already doing a big project on the road, what can we do here to help out the wildlife while we're at, you know, while we're at it? Let's work something into the design to help out the animals. And so we built a wildlife proof fence all along the highway. So if the animals can't get on the road, they can't be hit on the road, right? Put up your hand if you think this worked. Well, yes, it did. 
The fences have reduced collisions between cars and wildlife on our Trans-Canada Highway by over 80%. Pretty good, right? But that's not the end of the story. Let's go back to our satellite view for a second. If we were to just put a fence all along the highway, there's our highway in red, there would be no way for wildlife to get from one side of the park to another. So why is that a problem? Because animals have to move from place to place to find all of the things that they need to survive. Think about your daily needs, water, food, shelter. Wildlife need those too. And animals might need to move with the seasons. Like elk, they graze up high in the mountains all summer long, but then in the winter when the snow gets really high and thick in the top of, tops of the mountains, they'd have to move down to the valley bottom where they can dig through the little bit less of a snowpack to get to the grass underneath. And has anybody out there ever moved from one city to another or one country to another? Sometimes animals do that too. In their lifetime, they might have to find a completely new territory, like a lone wolf dispersing from the pack to establish a new pack all their own in a completely new place. So back to the issue of dividing the park with a fence along the highway. So here's the valley as we can imagine it originally, no barriers. These bears can travel anywhere for food, water, mates, and dens. And when the road through Banff was added over 100 years ago, there were maybe a couple of cars a day, so it really wasn't all that much of a barrier. But then more people started to drive through the park and there was an increase in accidents between cars and wildlife. If animals are killed on the road, it has a direct impact on their populations. And if we only build fences to keep the animals off the road, the bear on one side of the highway can't get to water or food, and the bear on the other side of the highway might not be able to find dens or a mate. And this can indirectly reduce the population after a while because the bears might have to move away to find the things that they need in life. And in the worst cases, a population that's cut off from others might die out. So to solve this, we built bridges and tunnels to reconnect the lines of travel from one side of the highway to another. Animals don't have to worry about getting hit by traffic and people don't have to worry so much about collisions with wildlife. Now, this is what it looks like in real life. This is what we see from the highway and some of my friends from Alberta, or maybe if you're from elsewhere and you've traveled a little bit here, you might've already seen these on the highway. So that's what our tunnels look like from the road, and this is what they look like on top. The sides of the wildlife overpass are built up a little bit to block the noise and the headlights from the traffic below, and the top of the crossing structure is covered in the same kind of plants surrounding of, of the whole surrounding area, so it looks quite natural uh, to the animals. Now, Banff's six wildlife overpasses are pretty easy for visitors to spot but our 38 underpasses might come as a bit of a surprise. These underpasses have several shapes and sizes. We've got culverts, open bridge spans, and some with water flowing through. But wait a second, there's something missing here. Where are the animals? We've spent all this money making bridges and tunnels just for the animals. Are they even using them? We need some evidence. Now remember, I asked about your spy skills earlier. This is where we get to practice them. A spy has to be smart, stealthy, observant, and most importantly, don't get caught. So what kind of tools does a spy need? Well, we can see some here. We've got binoculars, a notebook, a pen, a magnifying glass. So we use all of these tools, as well as some other special tools to study our wildlife in Banff National Park. We've got some motion activated cameras. And we use a little bit of high tech stuff with GPS, GIS, and some other acronyms. I'll explain. First of all, we're gonna look at the lowest tech that we use. Sometimes the low tech solutions do work the best. 
we simply look for animal tracks. In Banff, it's easiest to see the fresh tracks in fresh snow in the winter time. So we do a lot of this work in the winter. When you find a track, you can put together the clues to see where that animal has been. Maybe you can figure out what species left that track and which direction they were going. Like we follow those elk tracks, we can actually see the herd of elk in the distance there. Now, does anybody have any guesses about which animals left these tracks? Think about it for a second. Just think in your mind. The one on the left is made by a cougar or mountain lion or puma. They go by many names. And we've got some claw imprints on the one on the right there. And they're pretty big paw prints. I'm going to tell you, those are wolf tracks. Now, these are two of Banff's big, wary predators. They don't like to hang around humans all that much. So observing their travel patterns can tell us a lot about how our wildlife corridors are working all together. But as scientists, we don't randomly just go out looking for wildlife tracks. We do it systematically. So we draw lines on a map that we call transects. Transects allow us to check the same places all the time following the lines that we draw on a map. And this allows us to collect data from the same source, in this case, the same location, to be consistent from year to year. When we collect the tracking data and we put that information on a map, it gives us a picture like this. So the yellow lines on this picture are wolf tracks and the orange lines are cougar tracks. Now you notice what's right in the middle there? The town of Banff. So this tracking data proves that large carnivores are using the wildlife corridors right next to the town. The dots represent where we found predation sites. So uh, sometimes we find what the wolves and cougars had for dinner. Now from this graphic, we can tell that the wolves and cougars, we can tell where they prefer to travel. And from this, we can figure out where that overlaps with those human built lines that I was talking about earlier. Then we can try and see what we can do about those human caused barriers to animal movement. So I'm going to explore that idea a bit more in just a second. But first, we're going to look at another bit of the technology that we use. The parks motion activated wildlife cameras. So we set up these motion activated cameras in places that we know animals are likely to go. The camera's triggered to take a series of pictures when something walks by and we've had cameras on our highway animal crossings for over 20 years. So we have evidence about what animals use the crossing structures, which ones they prefer, when they cross, and a lot more information than that. They capture candid images of wildlife like this. Anyone know what kind of animal that is? A moose. So these images tell us quite a bit. First, first, most important that the animal underpasses and overpasses are actually working. So we can also see a bit of behavior in these pictures that gives us clues about how the animals interact with their environment. Like this, a whole family of cougars, that's pretty rare sighting. Now we can tell from the pictures which species use different types or locations of crossings the most. And we can see sometimes how many babies are with the mothers. What do we have here? Grizzly bears. Now uh, the pictures also tell us what time of day that they were on the move, what season. Sometimes we can even see from a series which direction they were traveling. And occasionally we just get a really gorgeous picture like this. This one is from an overpass, believe it or not. Look how natural that looks to the bear. You'd hardly know that this location was above four lanes of a very busy highway. So the cameras are great because they don't change the animal's behavior. We get a lot of observation off of that. But do you guys see something around the grizzly's neck here? Yeah, that is a GPS tracking collar. So that's another type of technology that we use to help us understand what wildlife need in our national park. The GPS callers send a signal to the satellite, which beams the information back down to Parks Canada staff. 
Now we obviously don't collar every animal in the park. That would be expensive, invasive, and a lot of work. So we only collar certain animals when we want to know exactly where they go and when, like the bison that we recently reintroduced, recently reintroduced to Banff National Park. So the bison are in a part of the park where they won't be crossing the highway. So we don't tend to see them on the cameras. This one was out in the middle of the woods. But we can tell exactly where they go and when they're out in the backcountry because of the GPS collars that they wear. So I've got a clip here of a bison location data animated onto a map. This shows two months worth of tracking where this one individual bison went. Now it's important for wildlife managers to understand how wildlife use the landscape and where they need to go so that we can keep those areas open and accessible to animals. And this is especially important with areas with a lot of human use. So the bison are out in that part of the park without a lot of, with no roads actually, and very little for visitor facilities. But what about back near the town of Banff? Hmm? Remember from our transect data that wolves and cougars travel all around that outside of town. And they're wary predators and they don't like to be around humans all that much. And remember this too, not much room for animals to get by town. So Parks Canada ecologists used all that data that we took from tracking, from cameras and collars to help us figure out where wildlife needed our help in getting from place to place whether that was by crossing the highway or going from one good habitat to another. And the data helped us to figure out where to put the overpasses and underpasses so that animals would use them. So let's go back to the satellite view. I've got a bit of a zoomed in view of the Bow Valley here. And we can see the highway in red and the steep bits in black. And there's just this little gap in between. That's what we call the Cascade Corridor. But back in the 1990s, there was an airport right there there was a scout camp and there was also a bison paddock and they were creating a pinch point and it meant that a lot of animals, wary predators like the wolves and cougars, wouldn't actually go through that part of the valley. It was a busy area. But then we removed these facilities and reconnected the lines of travel in the Cascade Corridor. And when you connect one good patch of habitat with another, that is called a wildlife corridor. So without wildlife corridors, good habitats become like islands. Animals have a hard time getting from one good patch of habitat to another. And this can cause smaller populations to die out from disease or maybe even lack of resources where they are. Wildlife corridors link good habitats. They're areas that are easy for animals to travel. Now, habitat is not all good quality in Banff National Park. Remember, we've got all that rock and ice at the top of our mountains, right? pretty variable. When wildlife corridors link good habitats with poorer habitats, healthy populations can grow in the good habitat and disperse to, from where they might be getting too crowded, and they'll fill in the gaps of population in other areas. And how we use space at different times is also important. For example, bears follow the seasonal ripening of berry crops, right? They need to get from one good patch of berries to another. But if they had to go through a busy picnic site to get to that next berry patch, they might hesitate to go there. But if we close that picnic area just during berry season and remove the human disturbance, the bears will find it easier to move from one good patch to another. So to work best, wildlife corridors should be undisturbed by people, but we can share the use of wildlife corridors by allowing different use at different times. So in the bigger picture, corridors are important for wildlife movement from day to day, from season to season for migration, and in their lifetimes for animals to disperse to new areas entirely. That's why we study and restore wildlife corridors in Banff National Park. This place is connected to a larger picture of conservation that goes beyond the lines that we draw on a map. The ability to move will be essential for many species to adapt to new weather patterns and changing growing seasons brought on by climate change. Now Banff sits in the middle of the Canadian Rockies 
as part of the larger Yellowstone to Yukon Wildlife Corridor. Animals like bears and wolves that range large distances will benefit from connecting the mountain ranges with protected habitat for the whole corridor from north to south and helping them will help thousands more species in the region. Banff National Park has considered a world leader in conservation for restoring and maintaining our wildlife corridors. And it will be a global task to reconnect wildlife corridors, lifelines, for the sake of all species worldwide. Because as you can see, nature knows no borders. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for that, Lori. That was amazing. Um, so uh, in addition to our live classes, and we've got seven live classes, we've got 13 groups watching on YouTube right now. So if you guys want to type in questions in the chat bar, let me know where you're coming from. Uh, I'd be happy to take on as many questions as we can from the YouTube groups as well. And, and Lori mentioned something that I forgot to mention in the beginning, and that is that February, the entire month, is dedicated to highlighting amazing women in science. Sorry, it's the second day. It's our second session, so I forgot to mention that. But really, all month long, incredible women from around the globe. So do tune in uh, month long on YouTube, in person, whatever. Uh, we're really looking forward to having you guys for our, our biggest month uh, ever. All right. Let's dive in with some questions. So I'm gonna start with Ms. Fisher's class. If you guys wanna kick us off, come on up. How do you get the GPS collars on them? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, let me just find a little graphic here. Okay, there we go. Go back to that for a second. So uh, when we want to put a GPS collar on a bear, for example, we actually have to trap and sedate that bear. So we're very careful about it. Um, we don't want to hurt the bear. So we make sure and give them a little eye mask and we give the bear supplemental oxygen so that they, um, they're breathing fine. And then we just clip a bear collar on them, make sure that it's nice and you know, not too tight on them. And uh, then we give them a little shot that reverses the immobilizing drugs and let them recover in that bear trap. So that's what we're seeing on the screen right now is the, uh, the bear trap that um, we put a little bit of tasty tidbit, something nice and uh, delicious to the bear. It's usually um, pretty stinky to be quite honest. You don't wanna get any of the bait on, on your clothes cause you'll smell terrible for weeks. Um, but the bears just, find that really drool worthy. So they'll follow that scent into the tube and then the door slams shut behind them. Then we have little, you can see little, um, little windows in there. And then that's where we give them the injection to immobilize the bear temporarily. We put the collar on and then we let them recover and then they go back out into the world to be a bear. The yeah. collars, it should be noted that the collars are designed to actually uh, come off naturally after usually about a year to 18 months. So that collar won't be on the bear for the rest of its life. Um, there's a little portion of the collar. Actually, I can show you a collar right here. There we go. There's a little portion that you can see the, the clip bit there. And so that's where little bolts will go through to attach that collar. And there's a little special strip of fabric. This one is, uh, is actually Velcro. That's not how we do it in real life. That's just how we do it when we use it for a prop on stage. Um, but there's a bit that's uh, designed to rot off so that the bear won't be wearing the collar for life. Fantastic. How cool is that? What neat tricks you guys have with those cameras too. <laughs> all right. Uh, We're so excited with these. Stories. It is. It's great technology. Um, all right, Miss Holt's class. How about you guys come up and if you have a question, go right ahead. Hey, if you're saying it, we can't actually hear you guys right now. Sorry. You should be demuted. I don't know what's going on, but Oh, there we go. <laughs> what materials do you use to make an animal bridge? Way to go. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Great. So yeah, what materials we use to make an animal bridge? It is, uh, I'm going to go back to my little, uh, there we go. So it's rocks, it's sand, it's gravel, it's um, planted on top with natural uh, trees. So you can see the construction picture there. So it's just like, kind of like we would use um, the same sort of technology as building any other part of the highway. We're just happen to be building a special bridge that's just for the animals. Excellent. All right. 
great question, guys, and, and way to have the backup way of doing it. That was fantastic. Um, all right, Miss Gary's group, you guys have one. Come on up. Do any animals jump over the fences? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. So I've got also a picture here of that's the fence. That's a little detail of the fence. So there we are. So that's actually the berm that I was talking about where we built up a little bit of the side of the animal overpass. So this is a picture of the animal overpass and you can see the fence just along the side there. Now, um, these fences are designed to be ungulate proof. So ungulates are animals like moose and bighorn sheep and deer and elk. Those are sort of the main ungulates that we have using the crossing structures in Banff. Um, those types of animals have a really hard time getting over the fence. I don't know an instance of any of them getting over the fence, but here's the trick. Black bears are built to climb. So they can and they do sometimes climb up and over our wildlife fencing. Um, also, we have to have ways for traffic to get on and off the road without going through a fence, right? So on the ground, we have tubes um, that are set in sequence. It's really hard for animals with hooves, like our ungulates, to get across those, uh, we call it a Texas gate. So thank you, Texas. Um, we call that a Texas gate and uh, wildlife with hooves can't really cross it. But if you have paws that are kind of soft and grippy, like a wolf or a coyote, sometimes they're able to cross across those Texas gates and get onto the highway within the wildlife fencing that way. And that's why in our national park, we still have a slower speed limit than outside of the national park, just in case we have those instances where wildlife does get on the highway. But overall, our wildlife fencing has reduced between people and wildlife on that highway by 80% or better. Amazing. All right. Thank you for that great answer. Um, Mrs. Drozny's class, if you guys have one, come on up. How many other animals wear those like collars? Yeah. Lori, oh, is Lori still there? Let's see. They appear to be having a little bit of technical difficulties. Well, we'll have to get them back in a second and uh, answer that question for you guys. While they're getting the tech back working, I, I just a quick note and, and we will get to that answer, I promise. Uh, I said at the beginning of the presentation and for our YouTube groups too, we've done a whole slew of presentations with Banff oh. National Park. So cutthroat trout, bison, fire and more. So when we're done this, I'm gonna pass along links to those. So you can check those out as well and learn a little bit more about the conservation story there and to their YouTube channel as well, which has some really, really fantastic programs. And Lori's back, good. <laughs> hey Lori. <laughs> What, at what point did I get cut off? <laughs> you were, no, you were good. Uh, the question was asked, uh, you know, you were done after answering your question. And the new question was, what other kinds of animals have these wildlife, uh, these collars on them? I missed the Drozny's class. Okay, so the other kinds of wildlife that we would collar here currently uh, would include grizzly bears and sometimes black bears. We have a few collars on the elk because they like to live right next to the town site of Banff. Uh, so we like to kind of keep a tab on them um, and our bison that were recently reintroduced to Banff National Park. So those are the main projects that we have on the way. Did I say wolves? We also include wolves in that. Yeah, uh, everyone and their brother. Fantastic. Um, Miss George's class. So I know you guys have a little bit of tech difficulty earlier on. So I'm going to see if you guys, if we can hear you guys. If we can, we'll take a question that way. And if not, we'll type it in the chat bar. So come on up and let's see. Try and say something. You should be good if it's working. No, I don't think so, but we love you guys. You guys are adorable. So type in a question in the chat bar. I know you know to do that. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um. How much animals do you call a year in total? Okay, I don't have an exact number of how many animals we call her every year. Um, it's probably in the range of a couple of dozen, um, but I don't actually have the figures on that right now. Send me the note and I'll get back to you. No worries, I love stumping questions, they're the best kind. Um, <laughs> all right, Ms. George's class, really quick with the, the mic uh, typing in, do you let the animals go after they wake up? 
Yes, yeah, but we make sure that they've recovered. Um, we don't want to send an animal back out into the forest uh, that's still kind of groggy and not too sure how its legs work. You know, we want to make sure that that animal is up and fully functioning before we release it back after the coloring process. Great question, guys. And please type in another Miss George's class. We'll take another one from you before we're done. Um, let's go to Miss Pearson's class, the, the Calgary group, which has probably seen all of these things before um, in person. So come on up, guys. Um, when you put on the cameras, do they flash or do they make a sound? Yeah, yeah they do make a little tiny click. So sometimes that does um, get the interest of the animal. If we go back to um, the very start of my show here, let's see. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite pictures of all time is actually uh, the one that's on my cover page here. This is a wolf um, that noticed the camera. So yeah, it did, it did hear the click in that case. But they're pretty subtle. So usually we, you know, it, with a little bit of wind or ambient noise, the animals usually don't notice the cameras. Okay, excellent. Great question, guys. I love these, these things. Um, let's take some YouTube ones. So Ms. McKay's group grade three is in Burlington, Ontario. Wanted to know uh, how many animals have been killed from crossing the roads. You, I'm not necessarily an exact figure. You'd said 80% reduction, but do we still see fatalities like that? Oh, uh, yeah, we, every once in a while, like I say, we have instances where the um, ones that can kind of evade our wildlife fencing can get onto the highway. It doesn't always end in tragedy. Um, sometimes we're able to persuade that animal to get back onto the wild side of the fence and avoid uh, trouble like that. But um, okay. yeah, there's a, a couple times a year, we do have- um, Something bad happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just looking cool. for that. There we go. So that gives you an idea of uh, the change in the wildlife fatalities that we saw on the highway previously, like in the 1980s, we saw a lot. And then since the 20, well, since, since our highway wildlife crossing structures went in, we see a lot less of uh, human wildlife conflict on the highway. Yeah, a testament to all the work you guys are doing. That's fantastic. Um, it's nice to be able to prove it. <laughs> it is, yes. Um, a second question from Ms. Mallet's group. So they are grade fours in Virginia Beach, lucky them. And they wanted to ask, how long does it take to make one of these animal bridges or, or underpasses? Right. So uh, when we build an overpass, um, usually the general construction takes about a year to a year and a half. Um, it's getting faster and cheaper to build these as time goes on because we're getting more familiar with the technology. So in the beginning, it was a matter of, you know, coming up with the whole idea. What's this wildlife crossing going to look like? What materials are we going to use? And with the kind of popularity, increase in popularity of wildlife crossing technology, not just in Banff, but this has been used as a model in many places in the world, in China, in Singapore, in the United States. Um, there's wildlife crossings now in New Zealand that are just like little tubes that are for penguins. Like these ideas are getting uh, spread and employed all around the world. It's so exciting to see for nature conservation. And um, you know, it's just getting easier to do because we have more information out there. So the crossing structures are getting cheaper and it's getting faster to build them. Fantastic. Also, we are going to need to do a follow-up presentation on penguin tubes, because that's amazing. Um, all right. Uh, we're ripping through questions, guys. So we're going to do a whole other round of questions. Take some more from YouTube. We're doing fantastically. So I'm going to go to Miss Fisher's class first. Come on up if you have a second one. Do you have um, any animals? Do you have any wildfires, animals that get caught in wildfires? Yeah. So is the question, do, do animals get caught in wildfires? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes they do. Um, you know, that's why we try to, if we're doing a prescribed fire, did you watch the, maybe the presentation about fire at another time? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if, uh, if, if we have a prescribed fire, usually we try and pay attention to things like where wolf dens are, and we will make sure that there's no um, no denning happening when there's no puppies around, for example. That's, that's one thing that we do to look out for the wildlife. Um, 
But when we have a wildfire, sometimes we lose some animals, but um, in the net gain, actually, um, there's gonna be more animals after the fire, believe it or not, because it really enriches the whole environment to have a fire go through. And I would recommend that you uh, watch my friend Alex's presentation about fire. She just um, gave one with Explore. I'm sure Jesse will put the link at the end of the presentation here. Yeah, great question, guys. Um, all right, Miss Gary's class, I know you guys are going, so let's take a question from you before you have to run off. Do more animals go over the highway or under the highway? Good question. Excellent question. So from our research, we can prove that different kinds of animals prefer different kinds of crossings. So um, animals that are really brave and kind of the big burly predators like cougars and black bears actually prefer to go through those little tight dark tunnels, those culverts, the, the um, underpasses. And animals like mother grizzly bears or prey animals like Lori, if you can hear me, you cut out a little bit again. <laughs> the animals have cut off the video feed. They trampled over the overpass and cut the link. So we're going to get her back in a second again. But yes, uh, for our class as well, she's getting that tech pack. Uh, we will pass along all the links to all the fire sessions if you guys, when you guys are done. And the bison had a, a neat corridor component to their presentation as well. So we uh, love these questions that are linking back to some of the other stuff that Banff has done. And uh, yeah, all right. I'm back. Be back a hey, Laurie, you're back. <laughs> hey, what's happening? No, that's okay. You're in the middle of it. So you're, you're talking about if some animals, mother grizzlies like to go in underpasses. And then from there, we want to follow up from there. Yeah. So um, mother grizzlies or prey species like elk and deer prefer to be somewhere bright where they can see all around them because they don't like surprises. They wouldn't like to go down, say, a proverbial dark alley, right? Whereas the predators like uh, black bears and cougars, they don't mind being somewhere um dark and enclosed because they're kind of the 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 big mean guys on the uh i wouldn't call them mean they're just doing what they're naturally built to do but they're not afraid to go into a tunnel like that whereas mama grizzlies or prey species prefer to be in the bright wide open areas fantastic question guys all right um let's head to miss holt's class come on back up go for it oh yeah your mic's off. Do you have the thing written? I forgot about this. Come write it. Take your time. I'll come right back. And it's, oh, there we go. Oh. What's the closest you got to a grizzly bear? Lori, personal oh, question. Personal <laughs> question. Oh, I love this. Um, in the park, we recommend that people stay at least 10 school bus lengths away from grizzly bears. And I'm proud to say that I have never personally been closer to a grizzly bear than that. But I had a really exciting moment with a grizzly. Uh, I did a hike out to a beautiful place called Mount Assiniboine. And while we were on that hike, we hiked in past this meadow one day and we hiked back out the next day. And as we were hiking back out the trail, I noticed a big bear scat. You guys know what scat is? Poo, right? Big, fresh bear poo. And I was like, uh-oh, we better start looking out for bears. So I told my friends, we're gonna all get right close together and we're gonna hike together and we're gonna talk a lot. And that just kind of rings the, bell's door, uh, the, the bear's doorbell and lets them know that, they're coming, that we're coming. So we walked a little bit further along the trail and indeed there was a bear just like a hundred meters away and it was digging in the ground with its huge beautiful claws and it was digging up ground squirrels. And we watched through binoculars mm -hmm. while that bear grabbed a ground squirrel eat it, and then it walked very calmly away. It knew we were there the whole time. It was so beautiful to see. Yeah, these are gorgeous animals, and it's nice that we have things that protect them and make sure that people can see them for generations to come and that they can live, but they're really amazing. If you've never been to Banff for any of our U.S. classrooms, make sure you get a chance to go one day. It's one of the greatest places in the world. Um, all right, we've got enough time for about five more questions. So I'm going to take one from Miss McGaffney Lee's class online. And she wanted to know, are animals afraid of noise on the highways? And you, you touched upon this a little bit, but if you could reiterate, that would be great. Yeah, so our wildlife overpasses have that little bit of uh, dirt built up at either side. And that kind of reduces the uh, noise and the glare of headlights at night on the overpass. So it looks a bit more natural to the animals. 
um, I would say you, you can observe animals reacting to big loud noises of any kind. So whether that's fireworks or that's traffic, like a big loud motorcycle goes by, they might react to that and move away somewhat. So that is one of the factors actually in keeping uh, good wildlife corridors, active wildlife corridors, is looking at noise and looking at light pollution. Um, what does that animal actually need to make that corridor useful for it? Yeah, fantastic. Now I know their mic isn't working, but I'll put the video on them so we can say hi again to Ms. George's class. Hi guys. And so their question was, do the animals challenge each other for territories within the park? Absolutely, yeah. We have uh, 6,641 square kilometers or 4,500-ish square miles in Banff National Park. And a uh, large male grizzlies territory is about 1,500 square kilometers of the park. And we have about 60 to 70 grizzly bears altogether. So if you do the math, that's maybe, I don't know, 20 big males, if we're lucky. And that's more than, you know, those territories overlap. Right, so sometimes they do come into conflict and they will scrap for territory. Fantastic, all right. Let's go to Mrs. Drozny's class. You guys have a question, come on up. Nice Batman shirt, man. <laughs> um, can you still um, track the animals if they travel very far away? Yeah. Can we still track them if they travel very far away? Yes, if they're uh, within our jurisdiction, within Banff National Park, we can track them uh, like the bison, for example, we had a couple of bison uh, that were really curious about what was to the east, um, which is farmland. And we didn't want the bison going out in that direction. We could tell exactly where they were and where they were exploring by the information from their GPS collar, even though they're outside of the borders of the park. So that technology still works uh, no matter where they are because it's going from a GPS collar up to a satellite and into our computers. So we can follow the movements of those animals um, pretty much no matter where they go. And one of the most amazing stories I know is about a little wolf named Pluey. And she went all the way through Banff National Park up to Jasper National Park, down into the state of Montana and back up round trip of about seven or 800 kilometers. And she's just a little lone black wolf. Um, and that was really one of the coolest things to open our eyes to that idea of the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor. So Banff is part of that bigger picture of big landscape conservation. Amazing, thank you so much, great answer. And then we'll wrap up with one last question from Ms. Oster's class. If you guys wanna kick it or wrap us up, come on up. Why don't you just put a fence right around the overpass on the highway for the animals? There is a fence along the sides of the overpass so that they won't fall off the sides into the traffic. And then the fence continues on and down along the sides of the highway. So if we put a fence on either end of the overpass, animals couldn't use it, right? So we need to make sure that the animals are, are guided by that fence up onto the overpass and then they cross the highway and disperse onto the other side. Make sense? I hope so. <laughs> I think so. Um, <laughs> Lori, before we wrap up, uh, so again, we've already talked about passing some of these fantastic BAMF resources to our classes when we're done. Is there a place that you want to just tell us a little bit about where people can go to learn more about BAMF or more about these animal corridors, more about anything you guys are doing for conservation? I'm sorry, a lot of that was garbled. <laughs> oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask if there's any places we want to guide classrooms to go learn more about BAMF, about the animal corridors, or about your conservation work. Yes, well, as you said at the very beginning of the uh, presentation here today, we have lots of great resources on our Parks Canada YouTube channel available in English and French. And uh, I would go to the Parks Canada website. There's lots of great information there and articles about current conservation initiatives. So do check those out. And I know um, on this live YouTube, we're gonna have some links to some of the resources as well. So um, also, come and visit us. We're free for youth under 17. Uh, it is free to visit any national park or national historic site. Come on down, bring your family and explore the amazing natural and cultural heritage of Canada.
Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Lorraine. I know this is your first one, but uh, if you've seen them before, you know the drill. What we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute the microphones of every class. And so boys and girls, if you guys could get ready to join me and saying a huge thank you to Lori for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. It's amazing. Awesome. I love the enthusiasm, guys. Thank you so, so much, Devin, for joining us today. That was really spectacular. Do look for those links when we're done. Uh, take part, learn more, watch some of our other sessions, and stay tuned for even more. We are so excited to continue sharing Banff National Park stories. Uh, thanks to all our classes. And Lori, thank you so much. That was spectacular. Thank well, you. Great time. Looking so very forward to